Good day to everyone, or rather, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are in the world. My name is Paddy Bluer, and I'm the new Public Affairs Director for the International Gas Union. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this event where we will present the key findings of our 2021 World LNG Report. As I'm sure you're aware, this is one of our flagship publications covering the development of a more and more vital segment of the global energy system. We're proud to be releasing the Global Energy Report for the 12th consecutive year. The IGU LNG Report is one of the most comprehensive public sources of information of the key developments in the LNG sector. This is because we can leverage the IGU's vast network of more than 160 members from the entire gas value chain in 85 countries across all corners of the world. This in turn permits us to collate a unique data set, which is great, but it's what we can do with that data that's important. The analysis of that data is why you're here. The stories that it can help us tell and in turn develop the understanding of the importance of the LNG value chain to global society, which is based on its unique flexibility and the core benefits of gas. We will be uploading a copy of the report on the control panel uh, so that you can take it away for the end of the conference. Next slide, please. Thank you. That's uh, just the standard caution regarding forward-looking statements. Um, I'd uh, like to quickly introduce you to your panel. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Bertha van Villet. Uh, she's the business intelligence man manager at Shell Energy, leading a team that is responsible for delivering insights on LNG, gas and power to decision makers. She also serves as chair of the task force for the International Gas Union World LNG Report. Since joining Shell in 2007, Bertha has held several roles in the upstream business development and upstream commercial at Shell, with assignments in the Netherlands, Philippines, as well, in, as, well as holding leading roles for portfolio new business development projects in Iraq and Iran. Kieran Rowe manages the S&P Global Public LNG Reporting Team, which covers key benchmarks, including JKM. Previously, Kieran works in pricing of other major commodity markets, ranging from crude oil to iron ore. Sindra Knudsen is Vice President in Rastad Energy's Markets Team with a focus on natural gas and LNG. He's responsible for the development of Rastad's Energy Gas Market Solutions service, providing data and analysis on global natural gas markets and fundamentals. Peter Keller is Principal of Peter Keller Associates, a consulting and advisory practice serving the international maritime industry. Mr. Keller is also chairman of CLNG, a UK-based organization that is committed to furthering the use of LNG as an important environmentally superior maritime fuel. If we could just go through to the third slide, please. I'd now uh, like to introduce you to Andy Callitz, who is De Deputy Secretary General of the IGU and Secretary General-elect, taking up his post in August of this year. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Paddy. Uh, hello from London this morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today from all corners of the world. Welcome to this very special global presentation of the 2021 World LNG Report. And I'd like to extend my gratitude and congratulations to the IGU LNG Committee on their hard work and the great outcome we're going to see today. They delivered this excellent report. I'd like to especially recognize Bertha and the, the whole report team. Bertha ably led the report for three years during the Korean presidency of the IGU. And of course, a separate thanks to each of our sponsors who made this production possible. And as a result, we have this year's excellent edition to present to you today. You're about to hear from our expert panel the highlights of what 2020 was like in the LNG sector and where we are now as a result. But before they do so, I'd like to briefly share a few reflections on the past year and its lessons, but also what to think uh, about what that means for the future. When the 2020 report came out just over a year ago, it was impossible to know the extent of the crisis that was just starting to unfold. The world just entered into its first COVID-19 lockdowns at the time. The crisis disturbed everything that was routine. It impacted every segment of the global economy. 
global society, it impacted LNG and the wider global gas markets. Yet, despite all that adversity, the people all around us demonstrated incredible qualities of kindness, of resilience and unity, which gives me absolute optimism about the future. From the ordinary people doing their part and following difficult measures imposed on them to control the spread of the pandemic, to the brave women and men on the front lines of healthcare and essential services, and everyone who played their part in helping us stay strong together and see this through. The gas sector too showed some incredible resilience and I think that the way it handled this absolutely unsettling year proves that this is an industry that is nimble, that is adaptable, that is innovative, and very quick and fast to evolve. We overcame pandemic-induced supply chain shocks. We overcame maintenance and operations challenges. We overcame uh, commercial difficulties and all the while continue to supply secure and reliable energy to the world. The gas industry proved its resilience, its flexibility, its reliability as it continuously delivered secure, clean and modern energy when and where it was needed. And the inherent flexibility of LNG was vital to this success. And as Joe Kang, the IGU president, recently highlighted, LNG quite literally delivered. Efficiently navigating between the huge drops in demand levels at the height of the pandemic lockdowns and the exceptional spikes in, the dem in demand when the northern winter deep freeze set the world's energy system uh, into crisis uh, at the end of the year. And it was able to adjust to immense demand fluctuations with incredible speed. In many instances, thanks to the agility, the reliability, the inherent flexibility of LNG, the lights stayed on. Buildings were heated and cooled. Families were able to prepare meals. Medical professionals could treat their patients and the world could work remotely. And I'm very proud to be representing this industry. And I think that its performance in the crisis underscores the value it brings for a sustainable pathway to recovery. But the pandemic also reminded us how critical access to clean and modern energy is, although many of us who are fortunate enough to have it on demand at any time likely did not fully appreciate it. Without secure and reliable NG, we could not have properly functioning hospitals, operate critical care units, access the internet to work, manufacture, store, and distribute vaccines, or be comfortable in our own homes. And gas is an absolutely essential component of having this access to clean, modern, reliable, secure, and affordable energy around the world, not just in the wealthy regions. And as the world's decision makers plan for the recovery from the health and economic crisis, seeking to align it with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, we at the IGU stress that this alignment is not achievable without gas. I'm not going to leave the matter of the IEA's net zero by 2050 roadmap report hanging in the air and leave this audience today wondering if I'm either implicitly or explicitly commenting. We at the IG have great respect for the IEA and its proven authority as an objective voice in global energy. But explicitly, I say to you all that whilst we are absolutely in support of the Paris Agreement and that support the aims and of the nationally determined contributions to decarbonize energy, the IG believes that the economic, the human, and the societal costs of the proposed IEA roadmap makes it very likely to be derailed. Our primary concerns are based around the very clear engineering, the liquidity provisions and the socioeconomic policy challenges in the abrupt systemic changes that this pathway and roadmap to 2050 proposes. As we've stated repeatedly before, an achievable transition must be based on energy that is available for all global society. Yes, it must be clean. Yes, the supply must be secure. And yes, it must be affordable. And the energy transition must be just. It must facilitate development, not cement poverty. 
gas in all forms, whether natural gas and hydrogen molecules alongside electrons and the necessary infrastructure are imperative to help individual countries meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Goals. These issues are inherent to the presentations today and they will be at the heart of the 28th World Gas Conference, which takes place in, uh, from the 23rd to the 27th of May 2022 in Daegu, Korea, where the focus will be a sustainable future powered by gas. The program will consider how to manage critical issues in the global energy discussions, such as meeting increasing demand by improving accessibility and availability and enhancing the affordability of energy, whilst at the same time, definitely lowering greenhouse gas emissions and improving air quality. Registrations have opened this week. Uh, the Korean Prime Minister Kim buk yum is confirmed as the first registrant already and with an estimated 12,000 attendees, including a cohort of the most senior executives, ministers, regulators, and stakeholders, we look forward to a mutually beneficial five days of discussion and debate in Daegu. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to hearing your presentations now. Thank you very much, Andy. We are now going to have a, uh, a brief video which summarizes the conclusions of the Global LNG report. We will then move to presentations starting with, starting with Bertha. Please run the film. The International Gas Union is the global voice of gas, made up of more than 150 member associations and corporations representing over 95% of the global gas market. This short video contains key findings of the 2021 IGU World LNG Report. In 2020, global LNG volume grew for another consecutive year, reaching 356.1 million tonnes. Yet, largely due to COVID-19, LNG trade grew only by 1.4 million tonnes in 2020 versus the remarkable 40.9 million tonne increase seen in 2019. Global LNG prices were volatile throughout the year. Spot prices in the Atlantic and Asia-Pacific basins plummeted to record lows in the first six months and then waged a breathtaking rally to hit multi-year highs at the start of 2021. The US and Australia saw the biggest growth in LNG exports. Australia became the largest exporter, overtaking Qatar in 2020, while the US retained third place and Russia remained fourth. Global liquefaction capacity continued to grow in 2020, reaching a new total of 452.9 million tons per annum, with all new capacity added in 2020, coming from the US. As of February 2021, over 130 million tons per annum of liquefaction capacity was under construction or sanctioned. And while most proposed liquefaction capacity in early 2021 was in the US and Canada, if all of its proposed capacity materializes, Africa too could emerge a key global LNG player. Small-scale LNG is an important expanding segment of the industry. Its much lower investment costs and short implementation timelines make it an attractive solution to expand energy access and to reduce pollution and emissions by switching from coal, oil and wood. At the end of 2020, floating storage and regasification and floating storage units already made up 7% of the global LNG vessel fleet. Most growth in net imports in 2020 came from key Asian buyers, unlike 2019 when Europe was a bigger driver of growth. Asia and Asia-Pacific remain the largest net importing regions, with a slight 1% decrease in Asia-Pacific and a 10% increase in Asia compared to 2019. China and India continued to be the powerhouses of demand growth, each importing over 11% more in 2020. As of February 2021, 39 markets had LNG receiving capabilities and global regasification capacity grew by 2% in 2020, reaching 850.1 million tons per annum. China, Chinese Taipei, India and Myanmar added significant regasification capacity in 2020. The increasing flexibility afforded by the global LNG trade is bringing new opportunities and 
and expanding access to new players. Myanmar joined the ranks of LNG importers in 2020, and Croatia was added to the list early 2021. In February 2021, 147.3 million tons per annum of new regasification capacity was under construction. By the end of 2021, new build terminals and expansion projects could connect new importers such as Ghana, El Salvador, Vietnam and Nicaragua to the global gas market. Offshore and floating regasification capacity grew by 5% in 2020, reaching 115.5 million tons per annum across 27 terminals. Growth in new markets for LNG as fuel also continued in 2020, helping the shipping industry meet stricter environmental and emission reduction regulations. LNG consumption as a marine fuel grew five-fold in less than five years, reaching 1.5 million tons in 2020. Energy as road fuel, mainly for heavy transport, also had a surge in demand, meeting a total of 11.7 million tons in 2020. During a time of uncertainty, LNG's inherent flexibility played a key role in maintaining global energy security, providing affordable, clean, modern energy to millions of people around the world. As world leaders plan for post-crisis recovery by building a better, more sustainable future, the IGU and the global gas industry stand ready to meet this challenge. The gas industry will continue to be a sustainability champion, minimizing methane emissions and enhancing efficiency across its value chain while helping the world achieve a possible and inclusive energy transition. Morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone who has dialed in. I've had the privilege of chairing the World LNG Report, Report Task Force for a third year and I'll be taking you through some of the key highlights of the 2021 IGU World LNG Report today, covering LNG trade, liquefaction and regasification developments in 2020. As Paddy has mentioned, my esteemed colleagues at Platz, Rystad and SDA LNG will cover other sections of the report. If we could go to the next slide, please. Before I get into the 2020 highlights, I'd like to express my gratitude to the task force I worked with this year to pull together the report. And you can see the members of the various organizations who contributed on the screen now. I'd also like to thank Rystad for their hard work with the task force to develop the 2021 report. And similarly, I'm very grateful to Platz for contributing the pricing section and data this year. Lastly, this is the second time we've used GIGNL data to cover trade developments, and I'd like to thank GIGNL for providing their trade data to us. If we could move to the next slide. Let's look at some of the key shifts in trade in 2020. While muted, global LNG trade grew in 2020 for another consecutive year to 356.1 million tons. Increases in exports were mostly a simple story of adding export capacity, as was the case in the US, where despite curtailments, 11 million tons more LNG was exported than in 2019. Other export increases were seen in Australia and Russia, who ramped up volumes from projects brought on stream in 2019. Decreases in exports were often the result of feed gas constraints, such as in Trinidad and Tobago, who exported 2.4 million tons less than in 2019, or the result of curtailments due to the challenging economics around exports when LNG and gas prices were low, as was the case for Malaysia, Egypt and Algeria. On the import side, growth was dominated by long-standing buyers such as China, India and South Korea adding a total of 11.7 million tons of net imports in 2020, despite waves of COVID restrictions. This was a marked change from 2019, when imports into Europe doubled as a result of low prices. In addition to the reduced imports into Europe, which were 4.3 million tons less than in 2019, noteworthy shifts include Mexico and Japan. Mexico imported more pipeline gas in 2020, with new pipeline sections being completed, thereby reducing the need for LNG imports. Japan's lower imports were largely driven by COVID-related restrictions, as well as high storage levels. On the re-export side, LNG re-exports grew to 2.6 million tons after a dip in 2019. Singapore and France continue to top the re-export loading list, uh, combining, sorry, re-exporting a combined volume of 1.5 million tons. And for Singapore, this was a doubling of its 2019 re-exports. If we could go to the next slide, please. Rystad will go into some of the details of how COVID-19 impacted liquefaction. So I will focus on some of the more general trends. 
Global liquefaction capacity additions in 2020 all came from the US, totaling 20 million tons from new trains at Freeport, Cameron and Elba Island. This helped solidify the US position as the third largest exporter of LNG in the world. Australia maintained its position in the market with the highest nominal liquefaction capacity at 87.6 million tons per annum. 2020, though, was overall a tough year for liquefaction projects. Only one project took FID, the 3.3 million ton per annum project um, in Mexico called Energia Costa Azul, compared to uh, the total of 70.8 million tons that was sanctioned in 2019. 2020's only FID was followed early 2021 by Qatar Petroleum's landmark FID on the four train Northfield expansion project, adding 32 MTPA of capacity to the list of projects under construction. That brings the total volume of capacity under construction to 139.1 million tons per annum. The total volume of aspired pre-FID capacity stands at 892.4 million tons as of February of this year, of which most capacity is still in North America. The drop compared to February 2020, when it stood at 907.4 million tons, is a combination of the FIDs taken and several project plans being shelved. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Moving on to receiving capacity, we saw 19 million tons of regas capacity being added in 2020, bringing global capacity to a new high of 850.1 million tons as of February this year, across 39 markets. The 19 million tons per annum were primarily added in existing markets such as India, China, and Chinese Taipei, either through construction of new terminals or through expansion projects at existing terminals. Two new floating terminals were also added in 2020 and early 2021 in Brazil and in Croatia. Floating options continue to be favored by new markets. And this is also represented in the 10 FSRUs that form part of the 147.3 million ton per annum of new regasification capacity that is under construction as of February 2021. The 147.3 million tons of capacity that is under construction also includes 19 new onshore terminals and eight expansion projects at existing terminals. And over 70% of this capacity currently under construction is in Asia and in Asia Pacific. With that, I'd like to hand over to Kieran to talk us through the pricing section. Thanks very much, Peter. And um, thank you more broadly to the IGU for inviting Platts to provide uh, informa pricing information to the annual report. It's a great honor for us to be able to do that. Um, and also thanks for inviting us to, to present some of the findings at this, this webinar. My name's Kieran Rowe. I, I lead the pricing team uh, for LNG at Platts. Um, I'm, today I'm going to talk about, frankly, the remarkable uh, price progression we saw from the start of 2020 through to 2021, um, and you can see uh, you can see that really on 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 the slide on the left, uh, on the on the graph on the left. Um, and uh, if we click through uh, once more on on this slide, we can also see uh, the highlighted area on the slide on the on the graph on the right. There we are. Um, that shows one of the reasons why we saw prices move to a record high at the start of 2021. So LNG, as, as nearly everyone, I'm sure, in the audience is fully aware, is the only commodity really uh, of comparable size that still uses uh, prices from, from commodities other than itself. Um, one of the principal ones would be, uh, would be the, the Brent price, uh, Brent crude oil price, um, but also various uh, gas up prices are used as well uh, in the pricing of LNG. And this has um, uh, created some inefficiencies in the market that have probably contributed to some of the price moves in the LNG price itself, which is represented here by, by the, the JKM. Uh, the JKM reflects uh, deliveries of spot LNG into North Asia, the largest uh, demand hub globally. So briefly, uh, 2020 saw the record lowest price for LNG, um, below quite significantly below $2 um, MMBTU. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this price uh, 
was, was sort of the floor that we reached after a couple of years of price reductions that the pandemic in 2020 brought about um, even accelerating price uh, falls uh, in the LNG market. LNG as a as a as a as a commodity broadly followed uh, the sectoral trends in the first half of 2020 in that it it fell as a price. Um, and then in the, in the second half of 2020 or more Q4 2020, it also followed other commodities in increasing in price uh, as we as we headed towards the end of the year. The, the difference um, between LNG and, and many other commodities is the extent to which the price spiked in January. And we can see one of the reasons why uh, prices increased to a very, very big extent in January this year uh, with this chart on the right, which shows the really stellar demand growth that we saw in uh, North Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, and 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 other North Asian countries um, in uh, in jet from January through, right through to April, but January and February really saw extraordinary growth um, annually and, and therefore record demand growth as those markets continue to increase overall. If we could move to the next slide, we can see maybe in more detail the the low point that we reached um, for for LNG prices last year. Now. Uh, as I said, there's a sectoral trend across commodities for prices to fall in the first half of last year as there was a demand shock brought about by the waves of the pandemic as they ro uh, rolled across uh, the globe. Now, uh, this this uh, record low price in, in JKM um, was really also broke a couple of assumed uh, realities of this market as well because JKM actually fell, the delivered price, so this is after shipping and so on, the delivered price for LNG actually fell below Henry Hub on certain days uh, and fell below TTF uh, on, on certain days as well in that really low point in April uh, April uh, 2020. Um, now, one of the reasons why uh, a huge amount of cargoes from the US were not loaded last year, were, were cancelled from, uh, from loading programs, um, in, in the summer was because of the imbalance between the Henry Hub linked contract price and the dated Brent or Brent crude oil price. You can see that uh, Brent crude oil price actually uh, increased, uh, was, was at a very low level uh, and the Henry Hub price really stayed uh, quite, um, uh, quite, quite balanced in the early part of the year. And that meant that there was uh, less uh, incentive for people to lift cargoes uh, on a Henry Hub uh, related basis um, than, than maybe keep some of the Brent related cargo. So that was one of the reasons why we saw uh, cancellations above and beyond the fact that uh, companies could actually cancel those cargoes, whereas in other contracts, they were unable to cancel uh, cargoes because they were take or pay. So if we move to the next slide, we can now look at maybe the flip side of, of, of the coin and the record high prices that we saw uh, in January this year. And certainly the record low prices contributed to this. Um, a lot of companies uh, chose to exercise uh, downward quantity tolerance, DQT, and uh, reduce the cargo intake um, uh, where they could on their long-term contracts because the long-term contract price was higher than the spot price. So companies could uh, purchase from the spot market at a lower price uh, than they could uh, take cargoes from their long-term contract, which meant that maybe there'd be more cargoes cancelled um, from the long-term space, which meant companies were more reliant on the spot market than they had been at a time when the logistical chain for LNG came under some strain. Uh, there was a bottleneck in uh, the Panama Canal, which uh, meant that cargoes could not flow as easily through that canal from the US to, the, to, to Asia Pacific as they could in the past. Uh, combined with a demand spike in North Asia, as I showed on the first slide of my presentation, combined with uh, supply outages, regional supply outages in the Asia Pacific region in Australia uh, and in Southeast Asia as well. And this confluence of factors um, created the conditions for uh, record prices in LNG. Interestingly enough, we saw a very, very similar uh, logistically and, and demand led uh, price spike in US gas uh, uh, locations only a month after this, uh, where prices went up to about a thousand dollars MMBTU in certain gas locations. Um, so this is just showing you on this on this slide some of the other 
prices that that, that jumped um, on the back of these logistical issues. We can see in the bottom left the um, uh, day ahead electricity price in Japan, which uh, which really spiked in January. Um, the price for trucked LNG on the bottom right, and also the freight rate for LNG cargoes, which, as I said, really really uh, went significantly higher in part because of the logistical constraints and the fact that vessels were taking longer um, to arrive at their destination market. So with that, I'll, I'll pass on uh, to Sindra. So thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the BIGU and also the committee for allowing Rice and Energy to take part in creating this, this flagship report and also inviting us to speak at this event. So my name is Sindri Knutsson. I'm, uh, I'm from Rice and Energy and I will take you through some of the core impacts that COVID-19 has been having on the market in 2020. Before I will we'll also share some of the highlights from the shipping sector and also how we have seen the use of both gas and LNG as a fuel and how the development there has been over the last year. But first I would just like to say a couple of words on, on the global gas market and that we have seen uh, that the global gas market has proven to be very resilient during 2020. Global demand of natural gas actually only fell 2% year on year in 2020 compared to coal, which fell about 4% and oil demand that fell about 8% year on year in 2020. So you have actually seen that, that the gas market has been very resilient. Uh, and the LNG market has been even more resilient than as my, my colleague from the panel here, Bitte, took us through. We have actually seen a growth of, of slightly under 1% in, in global LNG trade during 2020. But I will also have to mention that we were expecting to see a growth uh, in LNG trade of about 7 to 8% before COVID-19 hit the market. So you have actually seen strong impacts driven by COVID-19. And uh, you have seen impacts, as mentioned here earlier, on the demand, um, which in turn has been, been causing also supply disruptions. And that's also what we will see some of the impact on in this chart that we have in front of us now that is showing the average uh, utilization for the liquefaction facilities across all LNG exporting countries. Uh, so we did see that the average uh, utilization rate um, uh, was declining uh, across the line uh, and was averaging about 74.6% in 2020. But at the same time, you saw also um, very robust supply from many countries, including Papua New Guinea, Russia, Qatar as well, that uh, was producing at the utilization rate above 100% last year. So that's very robust. Uh, the biggest impact uh, that we saw on, on the utilization rates was uh, for the United States. So as mentioned here earlier, the uh, United States added about 20 million tons of new capacity, liquefaction capacity last year, uh, but supply, so energy exports, only increased about 12%. Uh, so the biggest decline in utilization rate was seen from the United States. And if you go to the next slide, we can have a look at the actual trade flows uh, of US LNG and exports of US LNG and the development there throughout 2020. So US LNG exports started very robust during the, the first uh, four months of the year. But as uh, COVID-19 hit the market, you saw the effect of demand. And as mentioned by my colleague here, Kieran, you saw uh, prices plunge. Uh, and all global price subs uh, went uh, below the $2 per MMBTU mark, you saw that that US LNG was not in the money. US LNG exports didn't get their cost covered in the market, and that's what led to this shut-in of, of US LNG and cancellation of cargos. Uh, so you actually saw a decline of about 70% in US LNG exports between May and August, driven by these cancellations. But then uh, looking, uh, but the shut-ins of US LNG actually supported to balance the market, uh, showing the flexibility of LNG, uh, but also supported by recovering Asian demand. You start to see favorable economics and improving price differentials between uh, Asian LNG prices and, and uh, US Henry Hub, which then led to a strong comeback in US LNG exports. And by the end of the year, you saw actually that US LNG exports increased with about 33% year on year in 2020. Um, you did see that the also liquefaction market saw some delays in startups, uh, but you also saw that uh, a delay in FIDs of new LNG 
projects during 2020. And if we go to the next slide, we can also have a look at how that impacted the, the import side of things. So the regasification capacity additions. Uh, so we estimate that about 32 million tons of regasification capacity was delayed during 2020 to a large extent driven by COVID-19. And you can see that by comparing uh, the actual additions and our, our planned incremental regasification capacity for 2020 here, looking at our estimate by the end of 2019, comparing that to our estimate by the end of 2020. Uh, and a lot of that capacity got delayed and that was driven by, by um, lockdowns that will slow down the construction of these facilities, but also from a commercial and financial perspective. Uncertainties in the demand also led to, to uh, delays of this capacity. And you saw that the capacity being delayed to 2021 uh, and onwards. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can also have a, a closer look at the, the shifting in charter rates, also here introduced by, by, by Kieran uh, from, from Platts. Uh, but as the demand disruption hit the market and led to a shutdown of US LNG, you really saw a strong decline in, in the demand of ton mileage and the demand of shipping. So you did see, focusing here on the, the, um, the uh, 2020 numbers, you saw that global charter rates plunged significantly. And you saw that the chart rates for, for uh, steam propelled carriers dropped as low as $20,000 per day uh, during the summer. Uh, then you saw uh, $30,000 per day for the dual and triple fuel engines. And then the X, uh, XDF and MEG engines, the chart rates for those uh, propulsion types dropped as low as $40,000 per day. But then you also saw a strong recovery here during the, the uh, second half of the year, as you saw a recovery in demand in, in Asia you saw a comeback and call on US LNG and long, long distance voyages that uh, alongside with, uh, with delays in, in the Panama Canal on the transit side caused uh, chart rates to recover. And by, by December, you saw that the chart rates for the, the steam propelled carriers go beyond 100,000 per day, then 150,000 for the dual and triple fueled diesel engines, and then uh, above 160,000 per day for the XDF and MAG engines. And also as, as highlighted here by, by Kieran from, from Platts, these, these rally continued going into to January 2021. If we go to the next slide, uh, we can also have a look at some over at an overview over the, the entire LNG fleet. So during 2020, global LNG fleet increased to 572 vessels, including here both FSRUs and FSUs, and that represents an addition of 35 vessels compared to 2019, and it's showing a growth of about 7%. Uh, looking also at the order book, it's, that's quite strong. We have about 130 vessels. Uh, by the end of 2020, we had about 130 vessels in the order book, which represent um, 23% over the global existing fleet. So that just shows how strong the order book it, uh, is and what we can develop and expect uh, in the development here going forward. If we go to the next slide, um, we can have a look at some trends in the, uh, the use of gas and LNG as both as marine and road fuel. Uh, so in general, we have seen a, a push towards uh, using gas and energy as a, as a fuel driven by stricter environmental legislations uh, to reduce emissions, but also as we have seen that gas has been uh, had favorable pricing compared to other kinds of oil products. Um, so a consequence of that is that we have seen increased use of uh, additions on the capacity side, but also on the demand side. So first, if we have a look at the number of LNG bunking vessels by, by region here, uh, for the end of 2020, that increased to about 20 vessels. Uh, you saw three vessels being added uh, from Asia during 2020 and one uh, vessel addition from Europe. And currently about 75% of the, the existing uh, bunking vessels are operating in Europe. And you can also see, have a look at the growth that most of these uh, vessels has been adding been added over the last three to four years. And we can also see that the average capacity for these vessels is now uh, amounting to about 6,000 uh, cubic meters of LNG fuel capacity. Uh, LNG fuel capacity. That has also led to a uh, growth uh, in the LNG consumption uh, as a marine fuel. Uh, so during 2020, we saw that LNG consumption uh, as a marine fuel increased to 
five million tons. And this growth is, uh, so they, we have seen a five-fold in growth in under five years, so very strong growth here, facilitated by the, the increase in, in capacity. If we go to the next slide, uh, which is my final one, uh, we can have a look at the development of both natural gas and LNG demand used as the road fuel. So first, if we look at the uh, demand for compressed natural gas, we saw that the demand reached about 55.7 BCM in 2020, uh, and that we have seen a uh, cargo of or above uh, 5% of the last decade. And we see that the biggest markets for, for CNG is in Asia, driven by China, India, Iran. We see Brazil and Argentina, Latin America driving this growth, but also you have seen a lot of growth in, in, in the US lately. And looking at the CNG consumption uh, side, this is primarily for light duty vehicles. Uh, when we look at LNG consumption as a road fuel, uh, that is mainly used for heavy duty vehicles. And we've also seen a massive growth here over the last years. And in uh, 2020, uh, you saw overall LNG consumption as a road fuel increase to 11.7 um, million tons per annum, which is also a doubling of the demand since uh, 2017 levels. And the main market for LNG consumption as a road fuel is China, but we also see a, uh, the market developing in Europe. So overall, you've seen also a um, uh, strong development in LNG used in the, and gas used in the transportation sector in an overall uh, um, market that has been in a decline. So very firm development here, driven by focus on, on emissions and lower emissions, but also on affordable fuel. Now I will send the uh, uh, word over to, to my colleague Peter Keller that will go more into the uh, LNG side and transportation side. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about the maritime industry. As I think we know, it's an important international sector uh, with significant energy usage uh, that needs to continue to contribute uh, to global decarbonization and global air quality. As such, as, sea land, uh, as CLNG, uh, we certainly believe that the avenue uh, to that decarbonization and air quality uh, lies with liquefied natural gas. Please. <clears throat> Slide, please. We understand and know that uh, LNG is better environmentally. Uh, our recent sphere study, which we released earlier this year, uh, reconfirms the fact that uh, there was about a 23% reduction uh, in GHGs using the uh, two-stroke uh, high-pressure uh, engines. Uh, this, is, this is an important uh, update uh, because we are using current 2020-2021 data, uh, the latest information available from uh, all areas of the of the uh, OEM community, and it's important when we consider uh, other information that's in the environment, that's in the marketplace, uh, to look at current data, not 2017-2018 data because we all understand that uh, we are in a highly technological uh, environment where change happens and change happens very, very quickly. Next slide, please. We also know that in the area of, of, of methane slip, uh, that the two-stroke high-pressure engine has virtually no methane slip and that the OEMs are working uh, diligently uh, to reduce the issue of methane slip in other types of engines, the other type of two-stroke engines and the four-stroke engines. Uh, these are very, very important considerations. Uh, they continue to happen every day. And Sphera, who does our studies for us, uh, which are all peer-reviewed, by the way, uh, estimates that by uh, 2030, uh, methane slip will basically be a non-issue because of all the work currently being done by the OEM. At the same time, we know that uh, LNG is important uh, driver for air quality. Uh, we still have global health issues based upon air quality. 
And it's very, very important that we not lose sight of the fact uh, what LNG does and how powerful a, a defender of air quality it really is. Uh, and importantly, uh, LNG as a gas, as we know, does not uh, pollute uh, the water. Uh, it cannot pollute the water as other heavy fuels do and as other alternative uh, fuels might. So it's important to consider that as well in terms of, of the use of LNG and the use of LNG going forward. Next slide, please. LNG is also much better commercially, and we've heard this from, from other speakers before. It also has a very strong proven safety record uh, with over about 50 years of usage. When we talk about alternatives and when we talk about uh, other issues going on in the uh, maritime and in, in the environmental sector these days, uh, we really need to think about issues like energy density. Uh, it, it adds to the competitiveness of the pricing, the availability, uh, the operational aspects of it. And we know, for example, that uh, an alternative like ammonia uh, has almost half the energy density of, of LNG, which means a vessel would have to carry twice as much. Uh, that creates significant issues in terms of uh, vessel design, in terms of, of uh, cargo carrying capacity, and, and a host of other issues. And, and certainly hydrogen has even less energy density uh, than ammonia. So again, there are very, very significant issues uh, related to the vessels, their design, uh, their carrying capacity, and ultimately their competitiveness. <clears throat> and that's important from a commercial standpoint. Please. Next slide, please. LNG is also uh, becoming very, very available globally. Uh, this is something, uh, uh, this is a slide out of our Bunker Navigator tool on our website. And Clarkson predicts, for example, that by 2022, there will be 170 LNG ports. Uh, we believe that uh, you saw the numbers uh, in, in the previous presentation on the bunker vessels. We believe that that number is going to uh, approach 50 uh, by early 2023 on a global basis. So the so-called last mile, uh, which was always a discussion point, as to the availability of, of LNG globally <clears throat> is really starting to close. And 24 of the 25 top bunker ports in the world uh, now either have definitive plans or actually provide uh, LNG to vessels on a regular basis. Next slide, please. From a ship owner's perspective, uh, again, as you saw the growth of, uh, of the LNG fleet itself, uh, the, the, uh, the growth of the commercial fleet uh, is expanding significantly. Uh, we now see uh, about 20, uh, by 2023, uh, some 600 commercial vessels uh, in LNG service. This is up significantly uh, from, uh, from the current numbers. Uh, very encouragingly, uh, almost a fifth of the uh, new vessels being ordered in 2021 and 2021 has a very robust order book uh, right now of, uh, of new bills. The uh, NV reports that uh, about a fifth of that is going to be uh, LNG. We can we believe that 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 trend is going to continue and 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 we believe that uh, LNG will continue to be a very very important marine fuel going forward and that we will see significant growth in, in, its, in its usage, in the use of LNG uh, as, as an important marine fuel and continue to contribute, therefore, to uh, global decarbonization and air quality. Next slide, please. We also, in closing, would say that waiting is not an option. One of the things that we see happening in the maritime industry today is that many ship owners are waiting for ultimate solutions. Those ultimate solutions may or may not ever become commercially viable. They may or may not become 
uh, adaptable in uh, in the maritime sector. Uh, we need to remember that in the maritime sector, these ships are are out for weeks at a time. Uh, they cannot just recharge batteries or uh, or recharge themselves uh, every day. Uh, they are out on the seas, and every delay that we take, every week or every month that we make before we make a decision, uh, only makes the changes that are necessary uh, with the global climate initiatives more challenging. Waiting does not solve any problems. We know that alternatives are at least a decade away, require trillions of dollars of investment. None of that is necessary with LNG or its pathway forward with bio and synthetic products. Uh, we know that, we have the infrastructure, we have the technology, it's been proven in over 50 years, and we know that it cuts GHG emissions and air pollution today and provides a viable and important pathway for going forward uh, to the climate initiatives that we all know are necessary uh, for the shipping, for the maritime industry to deliver and for other industries to deliver as well. Uh, with that, I thank the, uh, the organizers of the IGU. I'd like to thank all our speakers. I'd like to thank Berta, Cinder, Kieran, Peter, and of course, Andy. I'd like to thank you for your time. And we are going to uh, finish now with a short film regarding World Gas Conference 2022. Uh, that we look forward to uh, sharing with you now.